Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video blog, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. Remembrance Day is November 11th, and it is a important day for us to pay remembrance to the men and women who have served our country in the military. And while we can't necessarily be getting together to um, engage in remembrance assemblies and other sorts of practices because of the COVID restrictions, it is even more important for us to look for ways to pay remembrance and to really understand the various experiences that are part of war and part of peace. Um, I worked on World War I commemoration materials a few years ago, and it was really transformative for me to understand on a more personal level the cost of war. And I think that's why archival materials relate to war and peace and home and battle can really help young people in particular uh, understand themselves and their emotions through these experiences of war. So it's not just these big names, big battles, but like these individuals. And that's why for Source Saturday, although it's actually not going to just be Saturday, I have five really amazing videos relate talking to historians about different archival material related to World War One and World War II. Today's video is with Dr. Stephen Davies, who is a professor at the Vancouver Island University, but he is also the director of the Canadian Letters and Images Project that has been a project since 2000, so for the last 20 years, collecting people's letters and images um, from the people that they know in their family that have served in the war. They digitize them, they put them online, sometimes they even record a transcript of them and make them available to people. And there is just an amazing collection of letters that I first got to get to know by seeing the tweets that gets put out on their Twitter account every day that's just like a little snippet from a letter. And it's such an impactful project to be able to like think of these often young men writing these poignant things and they're, I mean, I guess they're poignant in hindsight in particular, but like it's been a really great way to remember the individuals who are part of these militaristic conflicts. And I'm just really excited to be able to talk to Stephen about the project today. And he has identified a couple really great letters that I haven't even looked at yet that are not just about a soldier from World War I, but also the corresponding letter from his wife. And it's just a really great treat to be able to talk to Stephen about this letter or these letters and why they're such a unique element to the collection and the collection as a whole. So let's go over to Zoom and talk with Stephen. Um, Stephen, I am so glad to connect with you, especially uh, leading up to Remembrance Day. I think your project, especially on Twitter, is so interesting, and the collection that you have as part of this project is so amazing that it's just such a treat to be able to talk with you about the letters and images that are part of this project. Um, before we begin, can you introduce yourself? I'm Dr. Stephen Davies. I'm a historian at Vancouver Island University, and I'm the director of the Canadian Letters and Images Project. And how long has the project been on for? Over like 15 years? This is our 20th year now. Oh, wow. That, and I mean, that must be why you have such an amazing collection, um, because you have, you have such a legacy that you're drawing on. That's right. I mean, we've built up a momentum, and now we're not even really soliciting collections. I'm getting emails. We have a collection. Would you like to use it? So the materials just keep literally coming in every week, every month to us. It's, um, it really is a testament to how important it is to have a project that collects this, but how important people think of these letters and images from soldiers and on the home front um, during different armed conflicts. Um, I know we're going to talk about a particular set of letters, but maybe you can introduce the project as a whole. Um, I'm actually just going to say that again because I wasn't ready with the right thing. Um, I know we're going to talk about a particular set of letters, but why don't we talk about the project as a whole before we get to them? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Canadian Letters and Images project, other than uh, it's been around for 20 years? 
Yes, well, it's been around for 20 years, and what we do is that we uh, digitize personal materials of Canadians involved in the war front, um, any war. So we have materials going back to um, the Real Rebellion, South African War, World War I, World War II. Uh, and what's unusual about these letters uh, or materials, they're not all letters, is that they are literally coming out of closets and attics of Canadians across the country. They're not found in any archive. You won't be able to most of the time access these anywhere else. So what we struck is this win-win relationship with Canadians. Canadians are very proud of, of what their ancestors have done and they want to hold on to those family heirlooms, but at the same time, they want to share their stories. So what we do is we borrow them from the families, we digitize them, and then they go back to the families. And so that way we can bring these uh, materials, which are never seen, into the public domain so that students, researchers, general public has access to them. You know, that's so interesting when you're saying like these can't be found in any archive because you know, so often we think of archives as, as like the repository, but archives don't always or haven't always wanted to collect these personal um, ephemera, really, but, um, but people knew how important they were. And so it's amazing that you have created this project because like you said, you're borrowing from, but in digitizing, you're making it so much more accessible to anyone that wants to learn about um, these conflicts through the eyes of people that, um, that lived through them. That's right. The, the, the personal side of wars, which really fascinates me, and so the letters, I began using them as a teaching tool over 20 years ago, but there wasn't very much Canadian material available. So the result was I created the project largely for my own students. I was hoping perhaps to get maybe 200, 300 letters on that they could work with. Uh, at that time, and it's since now grown, we've probably digitized more than 35,000 letters. Amazing. You know, thousands and thousands of photographs, diaries, uh, miscellaneous items. Each collection is unique, so sometimes it'll come with railway tickets or menus or programs, uh, photographs, diaries. The collections vary from a single letter to the collection we're going to talk about later, the Maze collection, which has nearly 200 letters. So. It's always exciting uh, to see what comes in in a collection. Uh, for historians, it's like Christmas morning, you open up the box and you get to see things that you've never seen before. And you, you get really excited because it's, uh, you get to tell that story. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to work with these materials and share these stories and preserve these stories. And for me, what it does is it takes teaching history out of the realm of when we talk about wars, it's about statistics and battles. We can say, you know, over 60,000 Canadians died in World War I. That's a very large number for students to comprehend. You know, I think 60,000, they really can't grasp that. So the best way I, I find to teach about war is to reduce it down to the, the smallest component, which is an individual. Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at their letters, you see that, you see that humanity that's been lost. I mean, they're real individuals just like you and I. They had aspirations, they had hopes, they had girlfriends, boyfriends. They had all these things that were, we lose sight of when we think of them as veterans or simply fighting as soldiers. And I think that's really the important part about letters is they put a human face back to the war and allow us to really appreciate what, what's been lost, the richness of lives that have been lost. Um, you know, and that's similar when we look at the cenotaphs in any city and you see the names on the cenotaph, what's behind that name? Who were they? And I think that's really the most important thing about the letters and, and the project itself is it allows us to get back and see history uh, without a lens of interpretation. This mm. is not a historian saying this is what they thought, this is what they believed. This is the war, this is life seen through their eyes and their words. And I think that's very powerful. Yeah, it, it certainly is so powerful because I know I've worked with students on World War I letters and to just allow them to tell me what they are reading from them, like using their own words and using their own kind of understanding of the world, to me really highlighted how much more, uh, how much more um, tangible learning history can be when we allow young people in particular, but I mean, I think this is relevant for everyone to really connect faces and experiences and words to 
parts of history. And, you know, looking through these photographs, I, um, I was a project manager on a World War I exhibit, and so I've seen a lot of photographs <laughs> related to World War I, and, you know, they often wind up looking very similar, but the photographs that, that I'm just kind of browsing through right here are so much more unique than anything that I have seen before, and I can only imagine the letters are the same. So why don't we uh, flip over to the letters that we're talking about today. Um, you had a couple in mind, um, one from July 6th and one from July uh, 30th, but the same couple. So can you tell me a little bit about this source? So this is the uh, Will Mays collection, Amos William, it goes by Will, Will Mays collection. Uh, originally from Winnipeg, he was a pastor in Winnipeg. Uh, he was also a veteran of the South African War, uh, and he had been wounded in the South African War. So when he enlists in 1916, he's already 36 years old. He's married with two children, so off he goes again to war. Um, the letters that we're looking at, he was wounded, severely wounded in 1917. He survived. And so the letters are, first letters describing the battlefield uh, as he comes across it. He and a, uh, his friend are walking across what had been a battlefield. And the second letter is a letter uh, from his wife. Uh, she's got a telegram. He's been wounded, but knows nothing about it. She's frantic. She's crying, uh, has no information other than he's been severely wounded. And so one part is the one letter is about the battlefield and, and what it says in terms of the home front experience, because it connects to the home front. And the other side is the home front and what happens um, to the home front when something such as a, a injury happens. And for me, I think trying to look at the war, the home front and battlefront are really two parts of the same thing. You, you really can't separate them and you really impair our understanding of the war experience when you try and separate them. So uh, it's unusual, as you suggested, most materials, most letters are, it's a one-way conversation. It's from the soldier to the family, probably about 85% or so of that. There's another 15% that are saved but what we see routinely in letters is that soldiers say, well, you know, they have to carry their lives in their packs and there's only room for so many letters. So they will keep them for a while, then they burn them. And so we often don't see the other side of the conversation. These letters to uh, Will are saved because part of it, he had been in the hospital and, you know, maintained the letters, but it's rare to see a, a back and forth conversation. So. I think that, that's one of the unique things about this collection. Plus, it's, it's size. It's almost 200 letters, so it's very rich in terms of what it tells us about the war experience. Well, and, and the fact that he had uh, fought in another war and that he was married and he had children, and you said he was, uh, I think, bef like before we started recording, you said he was 36? He was 36 when he enlisted in 1916. So Okay, so 36, 37, uh, by the time of uh, these writings, like that's pretty rare too, because we think of it as a very much a young man's war. Um, and so to have this interaction with his wife and not like a wife from like a month earlier <laughs> is also very rare, um, which is very interesting. Like I love this line here that said, your little daughter will be an attentive nurse and she'll be happy that her daddy is home again. Like, because these are like, children, they're not, you know, babies, which I think is just such an interesting element to these, to this particular interaction. There's other letters in the collection where he writes specifically to his children and he does little oh, wow. drawings of daddy with his mustache and sort of little pen and ink drawings uh, for his children. So it's very sweet, that connection. And I think that's what's so important is that connection between home front and battle front, that the, mm -hmm. you know, the soldiers, um, you know, we think of soldiers and they're always soldiering, fighting. And the actual time in battle is very small. They spend the rest of their time sort of looking back to their lives or looking forward to what they're hoping to have. Uh, and so this, the letters are very important in that connection, keeping them connected to the home front, keeping them connected to past lives and future realities. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the letters, what, they, what they're hoping for. Yeah, so you're I, right. I mean, he's a bit old. So please. No, you're, you're quite correct because most of the letters are from younger men um, mm -hmm. and often often not married so the bulk of the recipients are actually mothers um, you know the writing home writing to the mother the mother is usually the chief recipient you'll see sometimes letters to their dad 
but mostly it's it's to the women who are who are the correspondents in the family. Yeah, and I think too about I mean it's so interesting what you said, which of course is true, but I never thought about it before that soldiers actually spend very a small percentage of their time actually in battle and everything else is like preparing for or anticipating but a lot of that is also about longing for home and um you know will would be able to speak as a husband and a father and be able to kind of touch upon those kind of deeper connections of those deeper emotions because he's older and that a, a letter from an 18 year old to a mother would have a different type of discourse around masculinity and like their own fears and their own hopes for the future but what a wonderful opportunity to be able to see someone a little bit more mature writing um and his wife's response back as well it's an interesting set of letters because you also get the the domestic side and the home front. She's asking a ton of advice, or he's giving her advice about the insurance or the bank or what mm -hmm. to do with the money and sort of trying to run the household by herself with two children. And he's also, you know, trying to help that way. Whereas in the younger letters, they're usually young single men. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different realm of experience. Um, so I just want to highlight for for anyone noticing at the bottom they have the scans because you do have I mean they're transcribed but then you also have the original scans which is just such a which just such a treat to be able to see that handwriting like I think it's important to be able to provide that transcripts to make it easier to read not because young people can't read handwriting these days but because handwriting is <laughs> difficult to read <laughs> um but like to have that transcript but then like to see you know all those x's and to be able to like see that signature and um I love from this one that we can see the the envelope as well as all of the letters on just like home paper um you know like paper you have around at home it's a very special kind of uh it's a very special interaction with the letters with the transcript and the scans as so we always try most collections we do have scans sometimes we only get um the transcriptions so we don't always have the, the actual letters but most of the time we do and i think it's really important um the transcription part is important because because that allows us a search engine to be able to pull up keywords right. so that and and read but I think it's really important for somebody to see what a World War one letter actually looks like uh, it's as close as you can get to an archival experience without actually being in the archives you've got the letters you, you've got the transcription and I think that really adds an element and I mean, as you're saying uh, students who can read uh, handwriting well I have usually six to eight research students working for me research assistants and I'll tell you, it's a steep learning curve for them trying to work on handwriting. Some of them just uh, the cursive writing. There are, some are really good and some it's baffling because they're, they're not used to that kind of writing. It's a whole different world for them. Yeah. And uh, I also find it interesting because my research assistants are basically the same age as many of these soldiers. You know, they're, they're 18, 19, 20 years old. And I think before they came to work for the project, they, their idea of a veteran was, what we used to see, you know, at the cenotaph on November 11th, some old people were in wheelchairs, and those are the veterans, and they fail to remember or fail to think about these people as they were 18 at one time. They were mm -hmm. these people writing, and I think it's important for them to understand um, that age and when they get to actually see the letter. And some handwriting is beautiful, and some it's you know clearly they, they can't write very well, but nonetheless, you know, they they put their thoughts to paper. And every letter is important. Every letter is worth saving, preserving and sharing. So I've told this story on the video series a lot, but not to you, Stephen, so you get to hear it again. But I worked with a student who was talking about World War One letters and he was like, it's like he's texting her and saying like, blah, 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 blah. And so of course he's not texting her, but they were able to talk about like, abbreviations that you would do or why like the different types of communication, like why a text over an email and like, talking about those different forms of communications with young people can really help make those connections between why this letter and what that letter would have meant like the significance of having that letter come from abroad and then like the significance of seeing an envelope like this come to your hospital bed for example um yeah is such an important connection 
So as a historian, as someone that's worked with these letters so much, we've kind of talked about this, but what do you read from these letters? Like, yes, the content of it, but what are some analytical elements that you think are really important and that you as a historian have read from them um, in ways that maybe if you are a young student, you might not get, get it right away? Again, one of the things I think is simply that relationship, the home front, and mm. um, a bit of trying to compartment, you know, in little compartments of home front, battle front, two different experiences that they're intertwined in so many ways. And I think that's really important for them to understand um, just how intertwined they are. Um, as you're talking about emails and texting, the lack of instantaneous communication, right? uh, that they're waiting, and uh, they're waiting weeks perhaps for a letter, they don't know what's happening, and, and that's what the Betty Mays problem for her is she doesn't know what's happening. So I think that, that um, connection is really important. The other thing that the, which the um, project has, and such as Betty Mays, is we get uh, a female voice for war. So often we think of war as, as a masculine occupation, and we don't hear the female voice. And a lot of these collections, we do have that female voice, whether it's you know, Betty being frantic about her husband, or women letters of condolence for loss. Uh, and I think that is a very strong reminder that we have to you know, not think of it simply as a, a male occupation. That there's this, this interrelationship that uh, we shouldn't try to separate when it comes to understanding the war. You know, I think too of like <laughs> the details he writes in this, like um, as you know, I didn't get a chance to read this particular letter before we started because you introduced it before we, um, we started talking. But like when I just am scanning this, I'm like, okay, yeah, he was on the battlefield. And then like decomposed beyond recognition, you cut off his belt buckle and then you buried the rest of him. Like the amount of violence that he's sharing, like shell holes with blood in them, but then how that is very much not in this letter. And I think of when you're saying like, we so often separate battlefield and home front, that like she read all of that, that's still there, that's now going to part of their relationship and like, but it not talked about and like that violence that people in this generation would have just known even if they weren't kind of talking through is for me so significant and so important to remember as a key element of war like just because you've stopped fighting doesn't mean that that those experiences aren't a key element of who you have become whether you're reading them or whether you're experiencing them you certainly wonder they were talking about uh, PTSD at that point. Right. Uh, but these individuals are expected after having gone all through this, they're just going to come back and go right back into a normal life. And one mm -hmm. wonders when you start to do this, uh, what kind of experiences. And um, I was doing a letter the other day on Twitter, and he's saying, person said, well, a dead body is nothing anymore, essentially. Mm. You know, it's, we feel for the families. It's because somebody's suffering at home. But for us, the sight of a, a dead body really means nothing anymore. So you wonder what they take home with them. Yeah. Um, in this particular letter, it's got both. It's got, it's got that sort of element of, it's not um, trying to show violence. It's just this graphic oh, description yeah. of what you see on every, and he goes on to say that, you know, that this is, war is, is devilish and hellish. And I think the really important part about that and why this letter um, is important is, is the connection again to the home front. Is what he finds. He finds, or they find a Canadian soldier that they can't identify. So they bury whatever they can. And he goes on to say, you know, so, some poor family's going to wonder, you know, and they'll never know what happened to him. And that's played out over and over again in families across Canada. The fact that we have um, the, the loss of, not only the loss of their family member, but the loss of the body. And so it's, it's, it's uh, there's, there be no sense of closure, really. I mean, it's one thing to have your son killed, but you know then he's got a grave, a proper grave. These people just disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, they end up with a name on the Vimy Memorial or the Men and Gate, but they never know. They'll never know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the sad part about this letter is, and that connection back to the home front is this is this is the kind of scene that's being played out over and over again across mm -hmm. Canada. You know, there's probably 
Uh, we have almost 66,000 Canadians killed in World War I. Um, close to, I believe, about 20,000 uh, were never found. The bodies just never found. And right. he's one of the... Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting when you were saying that your research assistants you know, are often very similar to the age of many of these soldiers and that they would see veterans as the older men at, um, at Remembrance Day ceremonies and not young people like them fighting in the war. And, you know, the more archival material that I look at related to experiences of soldiers during World War I and World War II in particular, although I do love that you also have the Korean War and other wars, most post-Korean War and pre-World War I um, really highlights that, those, those emotional connections that people are making across the ocean with their families and the weight of having to hold that and try to rebuild a life um, after that. And I, I really appreciate you bringing these two letters because I do think it shows that really well. How do you think, I mean, I feel like we've kind of talked about this, but how do you think that using letters like this help us challenge this particular narrative of war? Because so often when World War I and World War II are taught in schools, they spend so much time on it with all the details of battle, and there is an element about like, the glory of war and the heroics of war. Um, how do you think we can challenge the narratives of, of those wars and, uh, and other wars, military conflict, um, with the collections in this project? Well, I think you've said exactly that. Um, we have a narrative where we sort of took the glory of war. History of war, World War I, for example, is usually fought around battles. So we describe the battle and, and we talk about Vimy Ridge and we talk about you know, birth of a nation, but um, the human element gets lost. And that's why I think the letters are so important that we can shift that narrative away from, you know, it's, it's you know, nations go to war, but it's the individuals who fight the war. And I think we need to bring it down to that individual level rather than simply the broad national story and, you know, covering World War II or World War One in two or three pages. It just doesn't do it justice. And I think, you know, these stories are important to remind us, um, you know, we talk about Remembrance Day, we talk about sacrifice, well, who are these individuals? And when we can put that human face to war, then I think we really understand the cost of war for Canada, what was lost, and rather than simply, you know, we did this, lost, you know, we said 66,000, there's a number that students are going to be, it's going to be difficult to understand what that means, or battles with, you know, thousands of casualties. If you reduce it to the, that single story or the individual, then that changes the narrative. Then it changes our understanding of, of the cost of war. And I think that's probably the most important lesson we could take away from these collections. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's so important to think about the cost of war and that and that symbiotic relationship between the battlefront and the home front. Um, thank you so much for sharing the project and sharing these particular letters because it's, they are so well curated, but there are still lots of them. And I think it really shows that like, you can know some, which is great, but I mean, anyone that you like click on just has so, so many rich elements to it. Also, one of my cat's names is Betty. Um, and so when I see this, I'm just like, huh, oh, different Betty. Um, if people well, the, want, the other thing, please. Sorry, I was gonna say the other thing too about these particular two letters is that they're also an audio version of them. Right, so sorry. You, you, cannot, you know, for students, it's very powerful to listen to the recorded version. Uh, one is by the actor R.H. Thompson and the other is by the actress Cynthia Dale. And being able to simply listen to a letter, I think, and close your eyes and imagine that is also very powerful. And if um, people remember from the homepage, too, you also highlight all, uh, other guest readers, such as Rick Mercer, the Right Honorable David Johnson, Alex Trebek. Um, like, there's quite a few, like, special guest readers. How many guest readers have you had? Um, I think we've got about 20. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some are some are in there yet, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it was really fascinating that um, they would take the time to do that for free. 
that they volunteered to do the recording. Uh, even Alex Trebek, in fact, even did a little video from the set of Jeopardy talking about uh, the Canadian Letters and Images project. So it's, it's very um, important for us. It's, it does attract attention, which brings more people into the project. And the more people that come into the project, the more materials we're likely to get. Uh, and remind people that we, so we simply borrow them and we'll make uh, arrangements by courier at our expense to have them picked up and returned so that they're safe. We really want to make sure that the stories uh, are there for next generation. That's so fantastic. And uh, I will highlight, although, oh, I thought it was here, um, that there is a place where you can donate if people were interested in donating to the project, um, which is kind of a great way to keep supporting the project. And that there's also teacher resources um, that you said needs some updating, but I went through it and I think there's so many interesting things here because it highlights a letter with an activity that even if like the curriculum isn't as updated as it would have been like 10 years ago, um, like it's still very useful because because there are a lot of letters, right? So having these handouts here, I'm just gonna move that up, having the handouts here and then having, if I remember correctly, at the bottom, like some of the like particular elements that you can pull from. Like, I just thought it was so useful. Yeah, like here are the links right to the letters. I just thought it was so useful. So I hope people take advantage of that too. I hope so too. I mean, that was the reason was that, as we said, you've got 30,000 letters, you want to use the project, but where do you jump in? It's daunting. Right. So we thought we'd at least provide some basic guidelines. And uh, as you said, we want to update them. And if teachers are using the materials, I'd love to hear from them how they're using them in the classroom. It'd be great. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, I think uh, like I think that'd be great too. I'll put out a little call, but also do a couple like reminders throughout the year. Like, have you used these? And also, I'm going to assume it's okay if <laughs> people say I would love to use them, and this is well, this would be like another element that would be helpful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you seem uh, like you would be pretty open to want, that. <laughs> absolutely want them to be used. So whatever yeah, uh, students need or teachers, uh, absolutely great. Yeah, great. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for this. Are there other elements you want to ensure that we know about the project before we say goodbye? Um, I think we've covered it. I said, you know, it was just, we're always looking for more material. So okay. the words out there. You know, it's, it's slowed down because of the pandemic, so it's really myself only working on it because uh, we don't have students back in the office yet. So, but nonetheless, um, materials um, are so rich. I'm so impressed what Canadians are willing to share. Well, I spoke to some archivists uh, for my uh, video series in the spring, and some people were saying that, like, because of the pandemic and people are home, or they were, especially in the spring, um, that people have been, like, cleaning their, their like attics and other things and finding family heirlooms and so maybe people have come across a collection and it would be a great idea for them to think about that next step so um yeah that's wonderful you can just be in touch email me whatever and uh, we can go from there well, all of the information um, about the project, like the link to the website, the link to the letters that we talked about, your contact information is below the video and in the description, so people can get in touch with you that way, along with your Twitter handle. But of course, if anyone uh, emails me, I'll make sure that they get connected to you. But it was so wonderful to connect. I hope we stay connected. Thanks. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you.